Good morning and welcome to the NEMA Annual Business Meeting. Before we introduce this morning's breakfast speaker, I want to once again thank the many sponsors that helped make this event a success. We have a great lineup of speakers this morning. We're going to begin with our breakfast briefing sponsor, Strategex, and Joe Hahn, Vice President and 8020 expert at Strategex, will share winning strategies that many companies have used to grow despite challenges and disruptions. He'll explain the key to using disruptions as an opportunity to outperform your competitors. Plus, he'll demonstrate the tools and techniques of the 80-20 Pareto principle applied to leadership, crisis management, growth, and everything else in between. <clears throat> and Joe, welcome and take it away. Good morning. I'm really glad to be here. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, it's great to uh, have the opportunity to share these remarks with uh, with such an impressive group. And um, so as a result, I actually broke out my tie. The last time I wore my tie was uh, about a year ago at my son's wedding. And uh, shortly thereafter, they were expecting our second grandchild. So um, I'm careful not to break it out too often. Um, the power is pretty, pretty amazing. I, uh, I titled my remarks this morning, a Challenge as Opportunity. Um, and, um, and I did that because obviously, um, you know, we're, we're facing lots of challenges, right? Um, and I'm never sure if the clicker is going to catch up. It does. So all these things that you're seeing being posted on the screen right now are things you've heard before, right? I mean, uh, supply chain issues, we all know about those things. Um, inflation, we know about those things. Um, recession, is there one? <laughs> Has there been one? Is there going to be one? How bad is it going to be? Um, the global pandemic, geopolitical issues going on, right, in, in, in Ukraine, et cetera, and, um, and what they now call the Great Resignation, um, which is an issue that's not going to go away. Um, people costs and the way people want to work changing all the time, and these are major issues, right? And these are major disruptors, and, and they cause us, unfortunately, as we run our businesses day to day, to, um, to become distracted um, and to, be, to, to feel maybe even that we have to retrench because we're unsure. Um, you may think that, well, it doesn't apply to me, but you know it does. I, I can personally speak to this. Um, I drove up yesterday from Bonita Springs, which is where I live, and um, so there was a great disruptor for me not too long ago. Um, I, I had four, four feet of water in my garage. I lost two cars. I lost my first floor. I lost uh, all my electronics, all my furniture, lost my roof, and, and working with insurance companies is now a full-time job. Um, and you would think, right, that, um, you know, we can handle this stuff, right? Um, it's disruptive. It changes your life. And I'm an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer. My wife's a chemical engineer. She's a better one than I am, better one than I ever was. Um, and so we, have, we take a very tactical view of this, right? One step and then another step, and we work off the list. And you think you can just grind it out that way, and yet, and yet it still disrupts you, right? It still changes your life unbelievably. My master bedroom is now um, my washroom and my kitchen and my, my office, and I, that's the way it is, right? So in, in, a very, in a very micro sense, that's what we face when we face all these challenges. But at the same time, right, um, it's opportunity, and it's great opportunity. As I, as I read the, the NEMA PAC board out there, it said, you know, we're at the forefront of the electrification movement, and, um, and it's true. If you look at the way our world is and the way it's going to be, the way we power the world, as you all know better than I, is changing dramatically and will continue to do so. The way that we hydrate the world, changing, and, and, and unbelievably so. Um, the way that we feed the world, the way the world communicates, all of those things. Um, great opportunity is out there, and, there's, and, and there always is. Even during the Great Depression of the 1920s, there were some incredibly successful companies who made some incredibly smart bets and turned that into opportunity. The same is always true for us. And so what I'll talk about today, as it mentions the 80-20 rule, is ways that we actually take these downtimes and turn them into opportunities, right? Because during these disruptive periods, many of our competitors will do those retrenching and those disruptive acts that say, I'm going to step back, and they're not going to invest. And what we're going to say is there are ways in which to do that, right? So, so I come from ITW, so I work at Strategex now, but um, I spent 25 years at ITW, Illinois Toolworks, a number of years at Danaher. And I can tell you that we look for periods like this, these highly disruptive periods, as times of opportunity. We perform very well during good times. Who, who doesn't? Everybody does, correct? During good times, we're all riding the wave. 
Um, but we most outperformed our competition during disruptive times, during challenging times, during periods of recession, because those were the times where that's when you find out who's done it and who hasn't done it, right? And so we had a methodology that allowed us to invest during poor times, find markets that were there, markets with good fundamentals um, are worth investing in. And so when we talk about growth, let's define what that is. Is growth really just revenue growth? Yes, of course, it's that. But more to the point, if the market's got good fundamentals, market share growth is what it's all about. Um, if you can grow share in a very strong, fundamentally secure market, the opportunity then, when the market comes back, and it will, will be enormous. And the challenge, of course, in this and all of this is, where do I find the time? Where do I find the resources? How do I do all of this, right? And that's where this 80-20 rule comes in. And that's what I'll share with you in a few remarks today and just a few things. And I'm gonna give you some things you can take home um, and, 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 and do yourself and see what they tell you. A couple of fact-based things, the, the very basics. And some of you will look at this and say, my goodness, this sounds so basic. I think that's the beauty of it, right? So how do we find ways to invest more aggressively in down times and still wind up not costing us as much in time and treasure. So that's what we're talking about today. And the first thing I'll recommend is a book. And I get nothing for saying this is a great book. Um, I happened to walk into an airport um, some years ago and I saw this book. This is the book I saw, the exact one called The One Thing. And it said The One Thing. And you know, you're always looking for something to read, right? So I picked it up. And um, I started paging through it, and I found that it had a chapter on 80-20 in it, which automatically made it one of the greatest books written in history. Um, <clears throat> um, and I started reading through it, and what I said to myself was, my goodness, this book captures so well what I've been trying to tell people for so many years, right? Um, this methodology, this book captures it. And as I read through it, what I said was, my goodness, I'm going to start writing some of this stuff down. And I've got the notes here. I, I, the, the notes are still, are, are still here. Um, and you're gonna have the opportunity to do that yourself because I'm sure you notice on the way in, there's a pile of these books out there and they're for you. So on the way out today, grab your copy of The One Thing. If you've got one already and you've read it and you love it, leave it for somebody else, but read through the book. I'll just share a few things for you. Um, the first thing is, the, my, my favorite line in the book is, the goal is not to get more done, the goal is to have less to do. Um, these are lines taken from the book. The goal is not to get more done, the goal is to have less to do, it's about focus, right? This entire discussion about challenges, opportunity, about how do I grow during these times, it's about focus, right? Um, focus will, will, will define it, so that's the goal. So give things that matter all the time they deserve. How many of us talk to our people and say, what are you spending your time on? Well, I'm spending most of my time on this. Ask them this question. Are you spending all of your time on that? You'd be surprised how often they'll say, what do you mean all my time? I have so many other things to do. And the next question is why? Did you know the word priority was never meant to be plural? The word priority is a Latin-based word, which was never meant to be made plural. Somehow or another, we screwed that up and we made it plural. Now we have many priorities, right? One, priority, right? So it's about focus. So I'll just share with you a couple of lines in here. And then I encourage you to read the book and, and fill in your own lines. But here are some of my favorites. <clears throat> give what matters most all the time it deserves. Here's another good one. Extraordinary results are directly determined by how narrow you can make your focus, right? Um, there can be only one most important thing. Um, doing the most important thing is always the most important thing. I love this one, the definition of multitasking. The definition of multitasking is the ability to screw up more than one thing at a time. I think that's right. Um, Check this out, people, people don't decide their futures. People decide their habits. Their habits decide their future. So what today is about in 20 minutes is going to be about you know, looking at your habits and, and can you improve your habits, right? And then finally, again, the goal is not to, the goal is, to, is, is, is not to get more done, the goal is to have less to do. And I'll share one thing, one, I, I read through this all the time. Uh, this is from the book, as, as Henry David Thoreau said, quote, it's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. Um, the question is, what are we busy about? Knocking out 100 tasks for whatever the reason is a poor substitute for doing even one task that's meaningful. 
Not everything matters equally, and success isn't a game won by whoever does the most. Yet that is exactly how we play most of it on a daily basis. And believe it or not, the things that matter most scream, don't scream the loudest. The things that matter most don't scream the loudest. So we've got to find those things. They're hidden. Right? So read the book. That'll be enjoyable to you. Um, I'm going to share this with you as well. Um, it's a way of seeing whether your company is actually doing the most important thing very, very well. And the most important thing you can do with your business in any business is how do you leverage your people? How do you leverage your people? People are your most important asset. We say that to them all the time. But in addition to that, they're our most costly asset. In a manufacturing business outside of material cost, for sure people cost is your greatest cost, right? So how do we make sure we're leveraging that the best we can? And so the measure that's traditionally used for this is revenue per employee. I use it for a long time. Wanted to get $300,000 per year, right? So when I was at ITW, right, I, that, was our, that was our measure, $300,000 per employee on a yearly basis. Can we do that? And I found out that um, that was a very bad measure. Revenue is not a good measure on that top line. Why? Well, because costs go up. And when costs go up, right, what happens? Costs go up. If we're smart, we raise our prices. We have more revenue. Do we really have more value? The answer is no. We don't have any more value. So revenue is kind of an artificial term. What is not artificial is what you see here, material margin, which is revenue minus material cost. And that's value add. That's a true figure. That is not determined by what happens with the vagaries of cost. So material margin is a much better numerator there, right? So that's what I track. And even in distributor businesses, distributor businesses use purchase cost margin. Um, sales minus purchase cost. Um, that'll get you the same figure. The denominator was even worse, per employee, revenue per employee. I had managers of mine who did some really dumb things. They would wipe out 10, 15 employees and say, I've made my ratio better. 10, 15 new employees who, frankly, were the future of our organization, but they somehow artificially made this number better. I realized when that started happening that I didn't care how many employees I had. What I cared about was how much we paid them. And the ones I paid more, I expected more from. So what I did with the denominator is I said it's total employee cost dollar. It's uh, salary, it's fringe, it's bonus, it's workers' comp, it's uh, commissions, it's uh, consulting costs. We just dump it all in. Uh, I don't care if they're direct or they're salaried or whatever. They Just put all the employee costs in the bottom and then just do a ratio. How many material margin dollars, how many dollars am I spending on people? And see what the number tells you. That number is unassailable. That number is a tough taskmaster. And it'll lead you to the left side, which is if you're one to one, you're losing money. No way around it. Um, if you're 1.5, you're probably single digit op profit. If you're two to one, low double digit profit. And as you go further along down the line, you eventually get to world class. Is this a proxy for profitability? No question about it. Um, people say, well, why can't I just use my P&L? Yeah, but your people on the floor, the people at the point of the spear, they will understand this measure. They can impact this. And even more important than the number itself, although you should go back and calculate it, I would recommend you do that. It takes your finance people not long to do so. Um, even more important is the trend line. So when, when, when I look at a business I'm trying to help, the first thing I'll ask them to do is please give me 16 quarters of key ratio. The last 16 quarters, quarter by quarter by quarter, tell me what your material margin dollars divided by your total employee cost dollar was, and then let's plot it. And if I see a downward trend, what I know is I gotta do something, I gotta do it pretty fast because I'm not leveraging my people cost well. I get a lot of businesses that tell me, you know, Joe, I'm growing well, but I, I'm, I'm not making any more money. Why is that? Well, it's because of the yellow line you see in the middle. It's a flat trend. I'm, I'm, I, as I add revenue, I'm adding more people cost. I'm not leveraging it well. Sometimes I see an upward trend, and what I tell them then is, please don't listen to anything I might tell you, because I'll only screw you up. Um, but then I say, maybe your key ratio is too high. Maybe you're not reinvesting in your business. This tells you a lot. So my, again, my recommendation sounds basic, but do it. Go back and have your finance people do a key ratio on your business for the last 16 quarters, and see what the data tells you. At ITW, one of my mentors, Jim Farrell, told me, Joe, just get the facts, let the facts tell you what to do. Um, so the question becomes, why should I listen to Jim Farrell? So I always share this at some point in my remarks. Um, when people say, well, this 80-20 ITW thing, did it, did it really have legs? So I give them this stat. During the 25 years I was at ITW, I joined them when we were 200 million. I retired from them when we were 19 billion. So we grew a lot during that time. I, I, at one point, I ran about a billion of it. Um, 
And, um, and during that 25-year period, we had a 19% compound annual shareholder return. So when I tell it to people, most people, a group like this will understand that. Many people don't. So then I ask the question, how many of you have stocks or mutual funds? They all raise their hand. And then I ask, how many of you would like to have your stocks return 19% this year? And then I say, how many of you would like to have your stocks return 19% every year for the next 25 years, irrespective of all these disruptions? And they all raise their hand, and I say, that's what we did. And so when we talk about growth as opportunity, when we talk about this methodology, using things like this, listen to Jim Farrell. He was right. I was smart enough to do so. Go back and do key ratio. See what it tells you. Your data is dying to tell you a story. Let it speak. Um, so what is 80-20? Um, I've got 15 minutes to get through this, and um, I think I can pull that off. This is the one chart I chose to kind of describe it. Everybody understands the left two. You're all like this. You all get it, right? So we've got a pyramid on the left, which is your customers. You've got a small group of customers at the top that are very large and a large group of customers on the bottom that are not very large, right? You've got a revenue pyramid, which is inverted. Those few customers at the top generate lots and lots of revenue. Those lots of little customers at the bottom don't generate a lot of revenue. And we all understand that. That's the 80-20 rule in action, right? The critical few, the, the, the more trivial many, right? But the key to the Nichols Pyramid, we call it the Nichols Pyramid because John Nichols was a guy who brought 80-20 to ATW in the first place, one of my mentors. Talk about a lucky guy, that's me. Um, he flipped the last pyramid on its head. Because if you listen to GAAP, if you listen to financial accounting, what they say is, how do we apply overhead costs? We apply overhead costs to our P&L by revenue, right? So the bigger you are, the, most, the more overhead you must absorb. And what Nichols said is that's not true. What Nichols said is we do financial accounting, of course, but managerial accounting is more important, which means that a little customer thinks they're as big as a big customer. They drive the same amount of resource allocation. When the phone rings at your company, doesn't it ring just the same whether it's a big customer or a small customer? It does. Big customer, one salesperson, two R&D people, they just don't drive the resources. So that, that was Nichols' hypothesis, which turned out to be theory, that, that big customers, there aren't many, they generate lots of revenue, and they don't require much overhead, which means their key ratio is really high, which means their profitability is really high. And if you actually were to draw a line through the middle of this chart, what you'd find is that above that chart, you make a lot of money. How much money? Roughly 150 to 200 percent of your profits. So I'll say that again. North of that line, halfway through it, you make 150 to 200 percent of your profits. What that means, of course, is that below that line, you lose money. That's a big qualifier to think about. People always say, I make more money on my big customers than I do on my little ones. And they're right. But what they still believe deep down in their souls is that they make something on those little ones, and the answer is you don't. The answer is that you don't. The answer is that the little ones need to be treated much differently if they're going to be profitable at all because of this Nichols Pyramids idea. So the Nichols Pyramids really is the 80-20 basis that says we have to treat them very differently. And the opportunity is to overserve those critical few at the top, which we don't do today. There's that line I was talking about. And this is reflected by quartile analysis. This is something you guys can do. Take it back, give it to your finance people. They can whip this out in an hour. Um, I'll put these numbers up, and then I'll explain what they are. What you do is you go back and you stack rank your customers or your products. It'll, it'll work out the same either way. Stack rank them from the biggest to the smallest by revenue. You can do it by gross margin, material margin, but it's all the same. Revenue is easier. Biggest customer all the way down to the smallest for any year period, fiscal or calendar, doesn't matter. Stack rank them, biggest or smallest, and then divide them by four. So if you have a, if you have a thousand customers, 250, 250, 250, 250. If you've got 500, 125 a piece. In this example, it's 200, so we go 50 a piece. Just divide them by four. Once you're done doing that, now figure out what percent of my revenue comes from each one of those quartiles. And the answer almost invariably will be, as you see here, 89,731. It's unbelievable to me still, after 30 years of doing this, 40 years of doing this, it's 89,731. I remember the first time I did this, I couldn't believe it. It's 89,731, it's 89,731. Which led me to a question, which I still ask myself today. Do you mean to tell me that half of my customers are 96% of my revenue and the other half is 4% of my revenue? Is that possible? 
Not only is it possible, it's, it's almost always true. So, first step, go back and see if it's true. Don't, don't, take a, don't take my word for it. Go back and see if it's true. But if it's true, now ask yourself the ramifications of that. Right, because the ramifications that are in the next column. What percent of my overhead, what percent of my effort am I putting into each one of those quartiles? And what we have found over the years, it's now theory, is that it's roughly 25, 25, 25, 25. You mean to tell me I spend as much on the little as I do on the big? Yeah, you do, why? Um, uh, no job too big or too small. Have it your way. We treat every customer like it's the only customer we have. That's what people do. The phone rings the same. It's just driven into us from birth that we treat everybody with equality. But as it's said in the one thing, equality is a lie. Equality is a lie. We can't treat them equally because some are more important than others. Believe me, I treat my wife much differently than I treat our CEO, David Philippi. He doesn't matter to me. My wife runs the household, right? So the equality is a lie. So if this is the case, what jumps out at you? Challenge is opportunity, you bet. Because, granted, if we take a look at 4% of the revenue and we realize we spend 50% of our overhead on that, that's a losing bet. We can be more profitable by having less overhead, which is true. But what's the great opportunity there? The great opportunity there is look at that 89% up top, serving it with only 25%. We should and can and must do more. So a very quick way to look at this is what if I sacrifice 1% of my, 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 my business and I took that 25% and reallocated up top, could I find markets that I could really focus on with dedicated attention, it's the only thing they work on, and would that generate greater growth? And that's what we found has happened. When people look at 80-20, they think of it as a cost thing. It's not. It's a growth thing. ATW, in the years I was there, we were top 50 every year in patents granted. How did that happen? It happened because we understood this fundamentally, that we needed to overserve our critical few at the chosen expense of the rest who needed to be treated much differently. And that opportunity is there for you. So when you look at being at the forefront of the electrification movement, right, where are you going to get the resources during the Great Resignation to, to, to fund those critical things, to, to put the time into those critical things? Here's an opportunity for you to do that. So, so again, read the one thing, for sure. Um, do your key ratio, for sure. Do your quartile analysis, for sure, and see if you turn out this way. And if you then turn out that way, now ask yourself, what do I do about that? Again, basically, fairly easy what to do. There's some nuance to it that you probably want to know about. But um, if you listen to the data, it's a really good place to start. So you can see, as I put up here, I always call them whales and minnows. One of my favorite lines is, um, there's two ways to grow a company. You can go catch a large fish, or you can get a bucket of minnows and feed them. Better to catch a large fish, right? So that's what this is all about. And uh, Maggie always does a really good job of that. So I'll give you one case study, and then I'll share one little personal 80-20 thing, and then I'll stand aside. So um, we could tell you numerous stories about, about how ITW did this very well, and how Danaher did this to a lesser degree, but still well and how many of the clientele that I've had the opportunity to work with over the last however many years have done this really well. But I'll just share one with you, and that's IDEX. Um, if you don't know, IDEX are a multi-billion dollar company out of Lake Forest, Illinois. Um, uh, run initially, um, uh, when I started working with them, by a guy named Andy Silvernail. Um, Andy has since moved on, and Eric Ashleman is there today. Um, and this is their story. They started 8020 back in 2010, right? So these numbers are dated, but that's so I can share them with you. Um, so they started in 2010, and this is what happened to them during that eight-year period where they really made 80-20 foundational to what they did, where they followed these rules I was sharing with you this morning. Um, their sales went up 67%. So when I say it's a growth thing, it's a growth thing, right? We spend time on this, not that. We do this, not that. We focus here, not there. And the result is greater growth. The result then is greater opportunity, right, leveraging, irrespective of disruption. Disruption eventually doesn't matter, and you could lock that into your head. Disruption doesn't matter. If you focus on their critical few and understand your data, disruption doesn't matter. Their op margin increased 670 basis points. Their earnings per share were up 272%, cash flow return on investment up 640 basis points, and their total shareholder return grew over 450%. Um, and if you asked Andy and you asked Eric, 
what's, what's responsible for this? They would simply say without question, without, without batting an eye, it's 80-20. Um, and you can see what they've done here. They, they, they changed their, their, little, um, their, their little insignia, right? Um, um, great teams, customer obsession, embrace 80-20. Simple things done well win for you, right? So that's 80-20 in a nutshell. And so what I'll wind up with today, and then I'll take a question or two if you're interested, but I always share one personal thing. You know, you, you will start living 80-20. I was chatting with one of my co-speakers this morning. You start living 80-20 if you do this right. So here's the way I, I, I do it, right? So I've, I've got a smartphone here, right? And you all have that, right? And this is my phone. You can call it. Um, it's turned off right now. It's turned off because I'm up here talking, right? So if anybody calls, oh my gosh, um, I, can't, I can't disrupt you. Um, but I've got, I've got some 80s in my life. My wife, Juliana, um, my son, Byron, uh, my daughter, Brittany, their spouses. Um, what if something life-threatening happened to them? My phone is turned off. I wouldn't be able to know it. Oh, yes, I would. Because this is my 80s phone. This is my critical few phone. Um, nobody has this number except Juliana, Byron, and Brittany. This phone is not turned off. I apologize. But if something were to happen, they would call me. So how's my son and my daughter and my wife, how are they doing right now? How do I know? Phone's not ringing. So do you think it's a good idea to know 24-7, no matter where you are, that the people who matter most in your life are doing OK? I think that's important. That's why you treat your 80s different from your 20s. And that's what this is all about. Challenge is opportunity is all about don't worry about the disruptions. Folks, they don't matter. You've got some great things in front of you. The electrification movement is a big deal. How we power this world is a big deal. It's coming. The opportunities are there. How you fund them and how you find time for them is a challenge. If you listen to this data, you will find that the resources you need and the focus and the attention and the, and the money you need to make sure that that becomes real is not something you have to go find. It is already there. It's just a hidden asset that through 8020 you can uncover. And I made it with a minute and 37 seconds to spare. I've never stopped, started and stopped talking in half an hour in my life. So I've got, a, I've got time for like one or two questions if you want. Any? If not, come see me. I'll be around. Um, grab your book outside. David is here in the back. He's our CEO. He makes me talk. Jen is here from our organization. Um, she's also a chemical engineer, so she's really smart. Um, and, uh, and I'll be around as well. So with one minute and 12 seconds to spare, that's all I got. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.